Hello friends, Kerrigan Skelly here with uh, Pinpoint Evangelism. And I want to address something that was uh, recently written on the Karm.org website, written by Tony Miano. Since he decided to include my name in it, I thought I would give a response to some things that were said in that article. And uh, I'm not only going to respond to things he said about me, but also some of the inconsistencies I see in the things he's saying. Now I know Mark Cahill and uh, you know he's he's not going to approve everything I say in this video I'm sure. I'm not passing it by him or anything like giving his approval for this and I'm not speaking for Mark Cahill or Mark Cahill Ministries. Uh, Mark Cahill's ministry is separate from my ministry. Uh, we are friends and we do know each other and we both believe in witnessing to the lost and being zealous about that but uh, this response that I'm doing right now has nothing to do with Mark or his ministry. I just want to make that very clear. Okay, so let's just look at this article. You can find his article. I'll put the, the link in the description down there. So if you want to follow along with some of the things I'm saying uh, about the article, you can do that for yourself. The first thing I want to respond to is in the article. I'm going to look at it right now from my computer here. It's, of course, towards the top of it. And under, he gives a little Mark Cahill bio at first. And then he, uh, under the subheading Mark Cahill and Calvinism, he says, uh, Please understand that our goal is not to promote Calvinism or Arminianism, rather is to encourage unity in the essentials and have charity uh, for one another in those areas who disagree. Uh, so he, he wants to promote unity, Christian unity, and encourage Christian unity in the essentials. The question becomes, what are the essentials? Who determines these things? You know, obviously as a Calvinist, Tony has determined that Calvinism meets the essentials. Okay? Uh, Mark Cahill, as a Bible believer, believes that Calvinism is a serious false teaching with a false gospel that maligns God's character. At least that's my understanding of Mark's position. If I'm wrong about that, then you can go to him and talk to him about that. But my understanding is that he believes it's a serious false teaching falling under Galatians 1 category is a false gospel because it doesn't say that Christ died for all or that all can be saved, but God wants all to be saved. It disagrees with those three things, and Mark, from my understanding of his position, thinks those things are very important, and I do too. And he thinks that Calvinism maligns God's character. Uh, so, from Tony's perspective, who is he to say that Mark is wrong about this? Who is he to say that Calvinism meets the essentials uh, and when Mark maybe thinks it doesn't. Uh, you know, did, did Tony hold some kind of official synod or council to decide what essentials were for everybody who claims to be a Christian and then include Calvinism in it, in it? And then if you say Calvinism doesn't meet the essentials, that you can't call it a false gospel. If you do call it a false gospel and a false teaching or that it maligns God's character, then you are come against people who are meeting the essentials of the Christian faith. So that's one inconsistency I see to start out with. And then he says, uh, charity towards one another where we disagree. This I find quite laughable because Calvinists, in my opinion, in my experience for the last five or six years, as a whole, not every single Calvinist that I've, I've talked to, but as a whole, are some of the most uncharitable, unkind, slanderous uh, group of people who call themselves Christians that I have ever dealt with in my Christian life for the last 15 and a half years. Of course, there are some who haven't been this way towards me, uh, but it has been few and far between. A lot of people who used to be good friends of mine, uh, who once I started saying that I didn't agree with Calvinism, I started coming out against it, against, uh, against it to some degree and saying how it's wrong and teaching things that they, teaching uh, on verses they say promotes Calvinism, I would teach the proper interpretation from my perspective and they began to slander me, stab me in the back, uh, lie about me, and be very uncharitable, unkind, and very slanderous towards me. So I would say that that's, that's pretty laughable that you want people to be, that you want Mark to be charitable towards uh, one another, where we disagree on things, charitable in your definition, of course, uh, when my experience of Calvinists is they've been the most uncharitable group there is. Um, he then goes on to say, we must stand in opposition to those 
to cause divisions in the body of Christ. Now, we all know, and I'm sure even Tony would agree with this, that divisions itself is not wrong. Uh, we must not uh, stay united on the altar of the truth. You must not forsake the truth for the sake of staying unified. But what makes you think, Tony, that that's not exactly what Mark is doing? That he's, not, that he's trying to stand in opposition to those who cause division. From my perspective, and I, I think Mark would agree with this, I have, I don't, he's never said this to me, but that Calvinism causes more divisions in the body of Christ than anything Mark's ever said or done, or anything any anti-Calvinist has ever said or done. Um, it has been the most divisive thing in theology in Christian circles that I've ever seen. I have seen nothing that divides more over the last five or six years in Christianity than Calvinism. I've seen it drive wedges in evangelism teams, between individuals, between groups, between churches, between pastors and churches, turn people uh, into evangelists for Calvinism instead of for the gospel, and cause people to lose zeal for the lost that they once had before they became a Calvinist. This is my testimony and a testimony of hundreds of other people who I have talked to. And then down the, down the article a little bit, uh, Tony gives his idea of what the essentials are. And um, you see this after an email. He talks about Mark calling him. And he sa talks about how Calvinism and Arminism are mutually exclusive. And he says the essentials would include the Trinity the deity of Christ, Christ's physical resurrection, salvation by grace through faith, etc. And then he gives an example of debatable issues. And I clicked on his hyperlink, The Essentials, which leads to a page on karm.org describing the essentials being the deity of Christ, um, the salvation by grace, the resurrection of Christ, the gospel, uh, monotheism, and then he gives secondary essentials of Jesus is the only way of salvation, Jesus is virgin birth, and the doctrine of the Trinity. The ironic thing about this is, see, now he wants to say Mark should include himself as a Calvinist and other Calvinists in the group of Christians as not being heretics, as being brothers and sisters in Christ, that Mark should do this because Calvinists agree with the essentials according to Tony and according to what karm.org says the essentials are. I'm not even saying I disagree with their, what they're saying the essentials are. I'm not, even saying, I'm not saying I'm disagreeing with that. But the ironic thing is that I agree with these essentials and he'll call me a heretic. I agree with all these essentials on this page at karm.org and uh, they'll call me a heretic. It's a little inconsistent, Tony. You see, when, when the ball is put in your court and someone calls you a heretic or doesn't want to call you a brother or sister in Christ like you've done to me and other cows have done to me, you don't, you don't like it. Um, and maybe you're getting a little taste of your own medicine here. I don't mean that in spite, but I, I think you should really consider these things and think about what you're doing that you have a log in your eye. So someone calls Calvinism heresy and a false gospel and you write an article about it contending it is not heresy and not a false gospel because you believe the essentials. Well, so do I. So are you ready to call me a brother in Christ? Now, Tony, are you ready to say that uh, I believe the essentials so I should be good to go? Well, I, I doubt that. I doubt that. Um, let's go back for a second here. My notes are a little jumbled up here. But um, he said that he was concerned about the negative effect on a cooperative effort for Calvinism. Well, who says that Mark Cahill or other anti-Calvinist want to have a cooperative effort with Christians who are evangelizing who call themselves Calvinists or who believe in the doctrines of Calvinism? Who says that Mark wants to cooperate with that? Now, you have to talk, about, talk to him if he wants to or not. I'm just using the hypothetical here. Just dealing with your, what you're saying, Tony, and, and checking the illogical consistencies in it. Who says he wants to have a cooperative effort with Calvinism? And who says if he believes Calvinism is a false teaching and a false gospel, who says he should? I mean, if he believes it's a false gospel and believes it's false teaching, 
why would he want to cooperate with it and with people who, who hold to it? Won't people who hold to Calvinism, when, they get peop when people get saved and they bring them into their church and disciple them, won't they teach them Calvinism anyway? And why, if Mark considers Calvinism to be a false teaching and a false gospel, why would he want that? Um, and then we're going to go down a little bit further, and um, we're going to see that uh, Tony says, as long as we s agree, getting back to this uh, agreeing to the essentials thing here, as long as we agree that we are saved by the grace of God alone, through faith alone, and Jesus Christ alone, then we are brothers in Christ. That's what Tony says. Well, Tony, I believe, Kerrigan Skelly believes, that we are saved by the grace of God alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone. But will you call me a brother in Christ? I doubt it. In fact, I, don't, I know very few Calvinists who are willing to say that to me, as a quote-unquote Pelagian, that they'll call me a brother in Christ, even though I believe those things, even though I believe the essentials. Uh, but I doubt you'll ever call me a brother in Christ, Tony. And then he starts to use a lot of adjectives uh, concerning Mark Cahill and what he says about Calvinism. Uh, he says that uh, there's a marginalization, a vilifying of them, a mistreating of Calvinists. Uh, but if, if Calvinism is a false gospel, if it is false teaching, why wouldn't someone want to marginalize it? Why wouldn't they want to push it off to the side and uh, not even really pay attention to it or try to refute it? Why wouldn't they want to keep new converts away from it? Why wouldn't they want to try to convince Christians through uh, rebuke, through exhortation, uh, through warnings, that it is a false teaching and to stay away from it. Why wouldn't they want to do it? Someone like what Calvinists do to me and what I teach and what I believe, uh, they'll marginalize me. They'll tell people I have nothing to do with me, do not preach with me, do not listen to his teaching videos. They try to marginalize me because um, they think I believe in false teaching. Even though I hold, according to Tony, according to karm.org, I hold to the essentials, I hold to... We're saved by the grace of God alone, through faith alone, and Jesus Christ alone. They'll marginalize me for those things. And so, but I, I saw no vilifying by Mark Cahill or mistreating of Calvinist. Um, I mean, if someone believes a false gospel, are they really your brother in Christ? If they really do believe in a false gospel, should you treat them like they're your brother in Christ? Well, if they believe a false gospel, according to Galatians 1, they're anathema. And uh, you may not, Calvinists may not see this as a very serious thing, saying that Christ didn't die for all, that God doesn't want all to be saved, that all can be saved, that all have free will to choose Christ or not, or reject Christ or not. They may not see these as serious things, but people who are non-Calvinists see these as very serious things. Uh, and so who are you to tell, as a Calvinist, to tell someone who th thinks it's a serious thing that it's not serious? Uh, it seems like you're pushing your essentials, your definition of essentials, and your definition of what is important and what is secondary on them. Well, maybe they don't believe what you believe on that. Maybe they believe they're actually important things and not secondary things. <laughs> then he accuses uh, Mark of having disdain for Calvinism because he, he said a couple of things. This is right, right above the subheading, Primary Issues with Mark Cahill. Uh, this is from a sermon Mark preached at Berean Bible Church in New York. He said, Be very careful a false teaching that says God pre-selects who goes to heaven and who goes to hell. That is absolutely unbiblical. Amen, Mark. I agree with that. I agree with that. Uh, then in verse 33, he quotes Romans, 5, Romans 1.20, and a quotation from Mark says, If God pre-selects who goes to heaven and who goes to hell, they would have an excuse when they stand before him. And, and Tony says that Mark saying these things in public shows a disdain for Calvinism. Well, what's wrong with that? Can't someone have a disdain for Calvinism if they consider it to be false teaching, a false gospel, one that maligns God's character and gives sinners an excuse for sin, one that misrepresents how God interacts with his human creation that are made in his image? Why shouldn't we show disdain for that? Don't you, Tony, show disdain for Pelagianism? 
Don't you, Tony, show disdain for those who don't believe in Calvinism as you see it and are very open and public about this? Uh, maybe some Arminians or some Pelagians should write a, an article about you talking about how you show disdain. See, it can go both ways here, Tony. You, you have a log in your eye and you're trying to take a speck out of Mark's eye. Um, so if you consider something to be false, a false teaching uh, or a false gospel, um, why, why shouldn't Mark follow in your footsteps, Tony, and show the same disdain for Calvinism that you show for Pelagianism, for example? Why shouldn't he show the same disdain for Calvinism? Who are you to say that Calvinism should be a part of this group of Christians accepted by everybody, but a Pelagianism should not be? And of course, I don't, Mark's not a Pelagian, I'm not saying that, I'm just using an example, because obviously, Tony, you show disdain for Pelagianism, and for those who hold the Pelagianism. You vilify them, and you ostracize them, you marginalize them, uh, and you have no problem with that. You don't think you're being uncharitable and loving. You think you're showing them a rebuke. You think you're trying to bring them to historical Christianity, according to your point of view. Well, Mark's doing the same thing. Why shouldn't he follow in your footsteps? Why can't he have the same disdain for Calvinism that you have for doctors like Pelagianism, or like non-Trinitarianism, or a, a theology that says that Christ was not born of a virgin? Or that you're saved by works. Why shouldn't why shouldn't Mark show the same disdain for Calvin that you show for those doctrines? <clears throat> and then he goes on to uh, to give the primary issues with Mark Cahill. And uh, under it says in Carm's opinion, Mark Cahill, and under two, he says to uh, be by lack of love, uh, lack of love by berating. Uh, I'm sorry by breaking fellowship with Calvinists and refuses to call them brothers or sisters in Christ. C, causes division in the body of Christ. And D, refuses to repent of a sinful treatment of fellow Christians and he refuses to reconcile with them. Okay, so let's, let's, let's think about this some more, okay? Uh, I really think, Tony, you have a log in your eye because you would do the same thing to people who you don't consider to be Christians. Um... Mark hasn't even, and from my understanding, I mean, he may not have called you a brother in Christ that day on the phone, uh, but from my understanding, I mean, I don't know everything Mark said to everybody. I don't think he's ever called a Calvinist a heretic, uh, like like you have called me a heretic. Um, yet, according to your definition, you treat me, Tony. Just let's just talk about me for example, because you mentioned me in the article. You treat me with disdain, according to your definition of what disdain is. You treat me with hatred. You refuse to reconcile with me. You're uncharitable towards me. You're malevolent towards me. You marginalize me. You vilify me. You mistreat me. Um, you treat me disparagingly and are divisive towards me. The very same things you're accusing Mark of doing, you do towards me. And I consider myself to be a Christian more than you do or not. I think I should be a part of this group of people who are considered Christians. By everybody, by Calvinists, by Arminians, by everyone. I think they should all consider me to be a Christian, as someone who you consider to be a Pelagian. But yet you, you do the same, very same things to me, Tony, that you're accusing Mark of doing. Uh, you willfully seek to divide the body of Christ from me, who I think I'm a part of the body of Christ. Uh, you refuse, you break fellowship with me, you tell others to break fellowship with me, you call me a heretic, which obviously is a, is a mode of trying to break fellowship. I mean, if someone posts something of mine on Facebook, for example, you'll tell the er other people to stay away from him too because he's posting videos of me on Facebook. Um, and, uh, of course, now, in number three, you're saying that he affiliates with people uh, with one known heretic. That's me. I'm the heretic. And uh, I, don't, I don't really care who thinks I'm a heretic. I hold myself to the scriptures. And if I can be shown from the scriptures that I'm wrong about something, I'm willing to repent. But I haven't been shown that by Calvinists, unfortunately. Um, so, and then you go on to say that, Calvin, that Cahill shuns uh, those who disagree with him. Uh, and actually questions their salvation. <laughs> That's the very same thing you do. I mean, of course, not everyone who disagree with you, but when they go past a certain line, like no original sin, you can be completely holy while you're here on earth, you don't believe in my theory of the atonement, the penal substitution, these kind of things, if you go beyond those, then 
you separate yourself, you shun those people and even question their salvation. Or you might even say they're definitely not saved. You might even say that. Um, and then I'm going to go towards the end of the article because I'm not going to go through what he says in the books about Mark's books or what these quotes are from these other professing Christians who are Calvinists and things they say because it's all about the same thing. They're all, they all seem to be almost like whining to some degree, complaining that uh, Mark Cahill won't call them a brother in Christ or that he's separating from them or won't preach with them anymore. That seems to be the main issue here. Uh, but getting down to this issue that uh, Cahill in league with a Pelagian and other angry anti calvinists First, let me address the subheading. Who said I'm angry? I, I, don't, I don't think I'm angry. If I'm angry at all, it's against false teaching. But uh, I think I treat Calvinists with lots of charity. You know, I do admit there's been times in the past that I haven't been as charitable as I should have been. And, uh, you know, it was difficult at times because of how uncharitable Calvinists are being towards me. And I'm not making an excuse, uh, but I've repented of that, you know, years ago. And I don't do that anymore. Um, but uh, to, to say that I'm angry or that someone else is angry, well, what if we are? Who says anger is wrong? Wasn't Jesus angry when he went to the temple courts and flipped the tables over? Doesn't the Bible say, be angry and sin not, in Paul's epistle to the Ephesians? So anger is not wrong. And if Calvinism is false teaching, if it is a false gospel, if it leads people to hell, if it maligns God's character, shouldn't we be angry about it? Shouldn't we be? I mean, common sense tells you you should be, if you ask me. I think it was on to say... Um, in the first paragraph under that subheading, that Pelagianism is a 5th century heresy condemned by all church councils that denies original sin, the imputed righteousness of Christ, and their federal headship of Adam. Really? So, church councils, according to you, Tony, decide what is truth and what isn't, what is heresy and what isn't, and is your, your main authority for determining what heresy is. I mean, if, if it isn't, why are you bothering to appeal to it? Why, why are you appealing to church? And you, and you do realize, Tony, that, that a lot of these church councils reject Calvinism. It wasn't called Calvinism, but the Calvinistic version of predestination, it rejects that as false teaching. So, I guess, according to these councils, I can use the same appeal to authority that you're doing. I can reject Calvinism based upon... Uh, these councils. Not only that, but these church councils sometimes disagree with each other. Now, when it's, if you're going to use it as your authority for determining heresy and non-heresy, then when they disagree, who's right and who isn't? You see, what determines what heresy is is the Bible. The clear, didactic, teaching epistles of the Scripture. They determine biblical doctrine. And... Uh, I have yet to see from a Calvinist how my doctrine is not biblical. And I have video after video after video showing how the Calvinistic interpretation of many passages is wrong, unbiblical, ungodly when it comes to soteriology. You know, Romans 9, John 6, Ephesians 1. Watch them for yourself. You can see for yourself. If you want to listen with an open mind and consider a different interpretation, a more biblical interpretation, in my opinion, of those scriptures. <laughs> he talks about how uh, Pelagism was condemned in the 5th century, and, it, and that Pelagism includes denying original sin, which is true. It does deny that. But that Pelagism also denies imputed righteousness of Christ and the federal headship of Adam. This is nonsense. Those two theories, the imputed righteousness of Christ, according to my research, the imputed righteousness of Christ can only be traced back as far as Luther in my studies. And there isn't one verse in the Bible that says that Christ's righteousness is transferred to us. It talks about God's righteousness. It talks about being the righteous of God in Christ. I agree with both those things. I am righteous because I am in Christ. I had my past sins forgiven. They're under the blood of Jesus Christ, forgiven, and I'm cleansed and I'm pardoned by his shed blood, by his sacrifice on the cross. And now I strive to walk in holiness every day of my life from here on out. And Tony calls this heresy. Um, 
but in the imputed but saying that Christ's righteousness is transferred to us only goes as far back as Luther. So if that's true, first of all, Tony's wrong about the councils uh, denying these things and rejecting these things. He's wrong about Pelagius and teaching these things, which it did not. And he's also wrong uh, by saying that if you don't believe in this, you're a heretic. Because if that's true, everyone before Luther, according to my research, I haven't. If someone can show me someone, before, I know mean, you're probably going to say it's found in the Bible, but let's show some verses for that. But if you can show me one writer besides Luther, before Luther, who talked about Christ's righteousness being transferred to us, I'd like to see it. I'm open to seeing. I haven't found that, and I've done a lot of studying on church history. So that that wasn't even believed in the fifth century, okay? That Christ's righteousness would trans even even Augustine or Augustine, depending on how you pronounce it, who is basically the founder of modern day Calvinism for the most part, he didn't believe in Christ's righteousness being transferred to us. And then he talked about the federal headship of Adam being uh, denied as heresy or being called heresy in the 5th century and being denied by all church councils as, as being wrong. That's not true either. So you, Tony, you're really just showing your ignorance of church history. I like to know of one church council that says that from the 5th century or from past or from or since then. The federal hell, headship of, of Adam, which basically says that uh, Adam act as a representative for the whole human race, and that when he sinned, we sinned with him, or we sinned in him. These are all. These are all. It kind of. They kind of go together. These two different original sin theories. That wasn't believed by anyone before Calvin, according to my research. And if you can show me someone who believed it before him, I'm willing and open to see that to look at that. But I haven't seen it, so there's no way that that was uh, denied by church councils from the fifth fifth century all up to the sixteenth century. And once again, church council will decide what is here, see what isn't. But I, I like to know um, what Bible verse there is for the federal headship theory either. What, what verse is out there, an explicit verse that says, we were in Adam sinning with him, or that he sinned as a representative and plunged the whole human race into sin or original sin because he sinned for us. What verse ever says a thing? And if you want to know more about what I believe on, the, on verses like Romans 5, 12 to 19, Psalm 21, 5, Psalm 53, Ephesians 2, all these verses that are proof texts used to prove original, supposedly prove original sin, these doctrines, you can go to my Refuting Calvinism channel and click on the Original Sin uh, playlist, and you'll find all my videos on original sin there. So, but I'm, I'm open. When it comes to original sin, which I do not believe in, I'm open to the scriptures, but I discuss the most prevalent proof text used in my videos. Uh, then he talks about the penal substitution atonement, which I deny, I do deny that, which says that God poured out his wrath upon his son on the cross, which the Bible never says. Uh, they read into some verses in Isaiah 53, but it never says that God poured out his wrath on his son. And I have a video discussing why I don't believe in the penal substitution theory of atonement. You can find that in my atonement videos playlist. Or if you wanted to know what imputation, propitiation mean, I have a video on that. And I'm planning on doing other videos on like words like reconciliation um, and what 2 Corinthians 5 means when it says that Jesus Christ became sin for us. And so I'm planning on doing other videos about the atonement. But this, this theory of the atonement, it's just a theory now. It's called a theory for a reason. Uh, was, wasn't believed until the Re Reformation. It wasn't even formulated in the current form it's in, in now until the Reformation. See, Tony keeps going back to the Reformation. He goes back to Luther, he goes back to Calvin, he goes back to the Reformation time for the, the substitution theory of atonement, the penal substitution theory of the atonement, and he never goes back further than that. But Christianity and church history didn't start in the 16th century. It goes way back before that. And if you're going to say, if people don't hold the doctrine that started in the 16th century, that they are heretics, you're basically condemning all the church before that. From the early church fathers like Papias, Ignatius, Clement of Rome, Polycarp, to Irenaeus, to uh, Justin Martyr, to Tertullian, to Origen, you're declaring them all to be heretics. Even Augustine, or Augustine, who is basically the founder of Calvinism, you're declaring him to be a heretic as well. 
And then we have uh, Mark quoting from, uh, or Tony, I'm sorry, Tony quoting from Mark uh, from a newsletter several years ago that he says, Cahill seems to have written, appears to have written a self-fulfilling prophecy. Uh, and he talks about, Mark talks about, I'm not going to give a paraphrase, he basically talks about how if, you know, beware of Mark Cahill, if you ever hear me teaching false doctrine, false teaching, run away from me as far as you can. That's, a, that's a basically a paraphrase of those two paragraphs there. And so, uh, he, and he quotes him, he says, get a, as far away from him as, pos, as, as you possibly can. And he says that, um, in our opinion, as long as Cahill remains unrepentant regarding his lack of love for Christians with whom he disagrees... You are not helping him come to repentance by asking him to speak in your church, conference, or camp. You are not helping him by purchasing his books. You are not helping him by donating to his ministry. By continuing to associate with or support Cahill, you are making it easier for him to justify his sin in his own heart and mind. You are, in effect, making it easier for him to remain in his unrepentant state. With concern for the body of Christ, and for Mark Cahill in particular, we must warn our Christian brethren to get as far away from Mark Cahill as you possibly can. So he accused him of promoting division, uh, of disfellowshipping people throughout this article, of a lack of love, of hatred, of marginalizing, of mistreating. <laughs> and you haven't proven that he's in sin. You haven't proven that one bit. All you've proven is that you think Calvinism should be included in the essentials of Christianity and that everyone should consider Calvinist Christians, even if Mark doesn't, which I'm not even sure he doesn't do that, um, and the very things you're accusing Mark of doing, you just did the very same thing in that one paragraph. You're promoting people to divide from Mark, you know, over somewhat, you know, concern for him, as you say, that you want him to repent. Or maybe he wants you to repent. Maybe he separates from people like you, Tony, and other Calvinists, and hopes that they and you will repent. That they, people won't support you and them, and that you'll come to repentance over your false doctrine. Um, you're promoting people disfellowshipping him. That's the very same thing you're accusing him of. You have a lack of love for him because you're doing these things. You're showing hatred towards him. You're marginalizing him. You're mistreating him. The very same things that you're accusing Mark of doing to Calvinists, you're now telling people to do to Mark because he thinks Calvinists aren't Christians, if he actually thinks that. Okay? You're doing the very thing you're accusing them. So in your own words, Tony, get away from Tony. Because Tony promotes division, disfellowshipping, lack of love, hatred, marginalization, and mistreating of Mark Cahill. So if you're going to follow your own instructions, uh, Tony, you ought to be telling everybody, get away from Tony Miano as quickly as you can. Of course, Carm too, which would include Matt Slick, since he's allowing you to post this on his website. Get away from Matt Slick as possibly can. Because Matt is actually obviously approving of everything you're saying. Otherwise, he wouldn't allow this to be posted on his website. And then you, you talk about um, Mark's reputation, integrity, how you want to see it restored. Well, you sure are helping. You are sure are helping him restore his reputation and integrity by writing this article and, and telling people to disfellowship with him and separate from him and, and to marginalize him. Very unloving and, and very hateful of you. Uh, but my contention is that Mark's integrity, Mark's reputation does not need to be restored. His reputation and integrity has not been tarnished, has not been brought down. I think he is standing up for the truth as he sees it. Whether I agree with him completely or not, he's standing up for the truth. His reputation and his integrity have been strengthened, in my opinion, even if I don't completely agree with everything he said about Calvinist. Um, he didn't back down from the truth. And so when someone stands up for the truth as they see it, and they don't back down from it, and they consider God's character over their own character, and consider God's reputation over their own reputation, because he, I mean, I'm sure Mark believes that God's character is misrepresented in Calvinism, is maligned in Calvinism, God's reputation is brought low in Calvinism, because it's taught as Christianity. And so he's standing up for that instead of himself. So at, at no cost, to, at, at whatever it costs is to himself, he wants to stand up for God and for God's truth. That, in my opinion, raises Mark's character. It raises his integrity. It raises his reputation to where uh, it's been high, it's higher than it was before. And then lastly, 
uh, he says, Tony says, is Cahill a false convert? He says, we do not know. What an amazing thing to say. And this is one of the bad things about Calvinism. It, it promotes uh, a continuous insecurity about your salvation. Now, of course, Calvinists are very biased in this. Tony would probably never say this about himself. Even if he went into grave, grieve sin, or grave sin, he would never say this about himself. But there's a perpetual insecurity in Calvinism. That even with someone like Mark Cahill, who's done so much for God and for the gospel, he promotes people getting out there. He's affected thousands, tens of thousands, probably hundreds of thousands of people's lives through his books, through his teaching ministry, through his videos, which are online. He affects people every single day. And you admit in the biography he's very generous towards people, giving books away, giving gospel tracts away, doing whatever he can to help people. And yet you'll say he might be possibly a false convert. Well, according to you, Tony, if he's an unregenerate, God-hating sinner who is not a Christian, he could, because if, if he's possibly a false convert, that's what you have to say about him. He's an unregenerate, God-hating sinner who's on his way to hell, and yet God, and then the devil is doing all these great things through Mark Cahill. Really, Tony? That's really what you want to say? That he's possibly a false convert? And not only that, the ministry you were just let go from, Living Waters, there's a famous quote from someone who's the head of that ministry, Ray Comfort. He says, I, I remember this quote so much, he says that there's only one person on this earth that makes me feel, feel lukewarm towards the lost, and that's Mark Cahill. Well, Tony, you just pronounced the one person who makes Ray Comfort feel lukewarm as possibly a false convert. Ray, I hope you have something to say about that. I hope you'll sit down with Tony and reason these things out with him uh, to help him see that the one person who makes you feel lukewarm on earth, there's no possible way he's a false convert. Because if a false convert makes you feel lukewarm, Ray Comfort, then you are the one who has a problem. But you know what? I, I think this, this whole article, it does not show love, in my opinion. It does not show concern for Mark Cahill. In fact, I saw another brother in Christ post on Facebook, if you really care for Mark Cahill, if you really love for him, you've done everything you can. You've, you've talked to him. You've had other people talk to him. Many Calvinists have talked to Mark Cahill. I know they have. He's told me about it. And not only that, you've tried to contact elders. You say you can't find them. So you've done everything you can do. Where does the Bible ever to say, post it in public for every professing Christian to see, and that will bring a brother to repentance. Where does the Bible ever say that? So you're not even following biblical restrictions when it comes to these things. But um, I don't think this is a loving thing to do. I don't think your, your aim is reconciliation. Now, I don't know for sure. I can't judge your heart. I don't know your heart. But from what I can see, this to me seems to be a way of defending Calvinism against someone who's attacking it. That's all it seems to be to me and trying to make it acceptable to those who feel like their doctrine is being attacked. That's what I see it as. Nothing more, nothing less. And the fact that you can't see your inconsistencies, Tony, that you even write an article like this, is you do the very same thing that people who call themselves Christians, uh, tells me that you're just, you're blind when it comes to this. And I really hope you'll come to repentance on this issue. I really hope you'll take this silly little article down, and see you have a log in your eye, and see that you're treating other people who call themselves Christians, who hold the essentials according to your definition of what the essentials are, and they also hold to the same gospel you do of, of we're saved by the grace of God alone, through faith alone, and Jesus Christ alone, people who hold to that, and you will still marginalize this fellowship and treat them as if they're not a brother or sister in Christ. You'll call them heretics. So I read over this article, I really felt compelled to say these things because uh, I know Mark won't stand up for himself. And I'm not really doing this necessarily to stand up for Mark, but the point out the inconsistency is that Mark doesn't believe about Calvinism the same thing you believe about Calvinism. It's obvious. If he did, he wouldn't be doing the things he's doing and saying the things he's saying. And if you're a Calvinist out there and Mark Cahill coming against Calvinism offends you, then maybe you ought to think about Calvin some more. Maybe you ought to think, well, maybe this isn't true. If someone like Mark Cahill, well, obviously knows God, and God's doing a lot through him, 
if he's coming so hard against Calvinism, then maybe there's something to that. Maybe I ought to rethink my position. Maybe I ought to go to the scriptures one more time and look at these passages that I say prove Calvinism. Romans 9, Ephesians 1, John 6, etc., Ephesians 2. And see if they really do uh, prove Calvinism. See if they really do teach Calvinism. Or maybe there's an alternative interpretation, a more biblical interpretation of those passages that doesn't support Calvinism at all. So I just want to edify you and, and exhort you in that way and encourage you in that way um, to really seek after the, the truth in these things and, um, and really look at this article through a different lens than the lens of Calvinism and Calvinists who are offended and who are... Uh, who seem to be more than anything whining about these things. God bless.